And the other thing I wanted to point your attention to are in the booklets in the back. You got TED Talks. You know about TED Talks? <laughs> so if you're done bored of studying this stuff, you take yourself a break and you watch a TED Talk. There's nine on each booklet, and they're all, they're all my favorites. And so the one I think you should watch for the next chapter, Animation of Unseen Biology down here. Because that's going to be, because I used to show them in the beginning of the class, and then I think I couldn't figure out how to get the speaker working, and then I st stopped, and I never restarted, and so, uh, I just put them on a booklet. But this one is great because it visualizes how cells um, uh, multiply and separate, mitosis. And we're gonna talk about mitosis on Wednesday when we talk about the cells. So it kind of lends itself into uh, what we're doing anyway. Good, all right. What are the three main, oh, today's about food. Three main macronutrients that make up the bulk of the organic compounds. Good. Fiber is what? <laughs> yes, it's part of the carbs. It's the undigestible part of the carbs. That's why we want to eat the vegetables. A lot of it is because of the fiber. Um, I mean, uh, uh, vitamins too, but fiber is the big one. Sometimes the vitamins and minerals are not that great in the foods anymore. And then water is obviously an inorganic compound, and it's not a macronutrient. Synthesizing or making large molecules, which are called polymers, from two small ones, which are called monomers. Mono is one, poly is many. Requires the creation of a bond. Both monomers have to give up some atoms in order to combine with one another. The atoms they let go happens to combine to a water molecule. How convenient. We're already water anyway. What is this process called? Dehydration synthesis, like you didn't drink enough water, so you dehydrate it. That's what I'm right now. You feel your lips get chappy and dry, and, you know, then you're gonna drink water. So that's the polymer monomer thing. Oh, and besides, um, carbs, protein, fats, also nucleic acid, the DNA stuff is also a micromolecule. It's just not stuff we uh, eat. Well, we, I guess we do eat it. Um, polymers are made by dehydration synthesis, so that's visualized here, where you have the two monomers, the OH and the H come from them, and, and taking away these atoms gives enough room to want to combine them and make one bond out of, well, two bonds, but the oxygen in between, will be connected to with that. So dehydration means without water. And then the other one is hydrolysis or hydrolysis. And basically you take the polymer, and you have a link together, and you have to add something. So you add the OH and the H back on, which that is basically water. So then you can split the bonds and have two monomers coming out of that. Lysis means to separate. Um, that's pretty straightforward, right? Question of that? No? Good? Look at that. You're going to be superstars by the end. This is the hardest chapter, I think. Well, I guess maybe the muscles a little, but I just like the muscles a lot. Carbohydrates consist of many different foods, vegetable fruit, but also bread as well as soda belong to that group. Glucose is a universal energy food, so we often eat carbs to get energy. Glucose is a monosaccharide. It's a one it's, it's one ring, it's a ring. Carbon, 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 and then so we're in oxygen. That's the ring, the carbon rings. And then each carbon has an OH and an H attached to it, and then that makes a, mo a monosaccharide. So that's a glucose molecule right there. So sugar is a di sugars are disaccharides. Di meaning two, so you take two of those rings and put them together, that makes, makes a sugar. Besides glucose, what other monosaccharide makes up table sugar? Fructose. 
So fructose tastes sweet. Glucose doesn't taste sweet. If you, um, where else the sugars? If you take malt, maltose, you got a, a glucose and a glucose combined together. And that doesn't taste good. And so the sweet is the fructose. That's why fruits are very sweet. Or that's why um, uh, high fructose corn syrup is sweeter than, sh than table sugar because there is more fructose component than glucose component. But it's only off by 5%, 45 to 55 versus 50-50. So it's, you know, people say it's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. It's not itself that bad, it's just bad, it's so cheap, so they put it in everything. That's what's really bad. So that's why we want to watch that, that high fructose corn syrup for sure. Um, that's why that is. So let's see what, oops. Let's see what next comes up here. So that's the cane sugar. Another important concept of understanding body function is the difference between hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydro means water, philic means loving, Phobic means fearing, you know that, right? Arachnophobia. Uh, how many, uh, how, how a molecule behaves in water, in a water environment is fundamental since we are so much water. So if a water, if a molecule is afraid of water, it, it's like oil, it separates out from the salad dressing, which is the oil and vinegar. That's the oily thing, the hydrophobic, versus, or if it's hydrophilic, which means it's like the water, it's like the vinegar itself. So it's like the sugar, in water dissolves. So that molecule is hydrophilic. And the reason um, carbs and proteins are hydrophilic because their hydrogen oxygen ratio is the same as water. Is that true or false? That's true. That is the reason. So when we get to the, when you look at the sugars, it's all. It's all these carbons, that, but these, the hydrogen, the oxygen, they are the same ratio as we have it in water. When we look at the fats, blah, 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 blah. Look at these. These are just carbon, carbon, carbon with two hydrogens on it. There is no oxygen. So that's a way different ratio. So that's why these separate out. They cannot mix with that ratio. So I know I never thought it was such an easy reason why, isn't it? Kind of weird, but that's the reason. Got to be known. Since glucose is a universal fuel, it is good for the body to store some for quick energy. Both the liver and muscle, and a little bit in the brain, can store long chains of glucose molecules called polysaccharides. What do we call those molecules in the body? Which one? Glycogen, there we go. That's the glycogen. And so, uh, glycogen is for us, and then cellulose is animals, I mean, it's plants, so we can't eat that, that's the fiber. We can't digest that, that's the fiber for us. And let's get to the obesity. If you've noticed a lot of people, oh, wait a minute, I need to do the, yeah, after six. You notice a lot of people these days deal with overweightness and obesity. There are reasons for that, and some are found in the food manufacturing industry. Food manipulation is big, it's actually very deadly. I should maybe change that. It's just the, the more these processed foods we eat, the worse it gets for our body. Because our brains are easily manipulated, and, and especially when we're overwhelmed with the commercial subliminal messages of all these like sports drinks and stuff like that, that aren't really sports drinks in the end. Uh, one of the wrong concepts is that fat in food makes us fat. The problem is that the body needs quite a bit of fat. Uh, your brain, for example, is mostly fat. Fat also satisfies when we eat, which means when we don't have them, we eat oops, more sugars containing foods. What does the body do with the excessive sugar? That's the problem with that. So we need to understand that we, we got kind of tricked a little bit in this food pyramid with that. Because it's not, you know, the farmers need to sell their grain. And so that's part of the thing. Especially with monoculture, since we got kind of since the 70s. And so it really 92 is when it went up. I have a video somewhere that shows the American map and 
the levels of overweightness going up, and you could do that in Europe too. It's the same thing. Maybe not as crazy, but the only difference is in Europe they walk more. Have you noticed that? All right. Let's see. We have a concept question that I want to put up here. How do I do that? There we go. I got to write them out. Too much writing here, but oh well. Carbs are broken down by the digestive system on the saccharides absorbed into the bloodstream. From there, glucose needs to enter the cells. Insulin is a hormone from the pancreas which alters protein channels in the cell's wall so that glucose can enter it and, um, uh, and be used to make energy. We talked about that glucose going into the cell a few times already. The problem is that the blood sugar makes the blood sticky. So if you put, you know, sugar water is sticky water. It's pain on the blood to clean it up compared to just water. It's the same with the blood. The more glucose in the blood, the stickier it is. And then that can damage body uh, um, cells. The body has sticky blood gets clogged in small arteries and make it very sick. Blah, blah. If we eat foods that enter the bloodstream quickly, the pancreas needs to work overtime, which makes it tired and at some point unable to make insulin efficiently. That makes sense. Like if you kick something and you want to work more and more and more, it's like an Amazon worker. You're going to break down. That's by the way why I try to get away from Amazon. Um, that's when one develops diabetes. What does the glycemic index describe? Anybody? No? Yes? Um, I said that the glycemic index describes like a ranking of the carbohydrates in food in a quantity to how they affect your blood level. Right. And how fast also. So, so, so that, you know, it's. It's not, it's one of the things that we can sort of understand a little bit. So the glycemic index gives us, when you look, you can look it up on Google, what's the glycemic index of a fruit that you want to know about? And it tells you how fast does the sugar get released in the bloodstream. And they use bread, I think, or, or rice or something, or sh actually sugar itself as a hunger. And when you look at that, a good carb, like, I don't know, a good healthy breakfast with some, you know, eggs and stuff and hearty breakfast, it releases, it releases the glucose level a little bit and then the insulin goes right with it and it sort of balances itself out. If you eat a donut with coffee, it goes way up way fast and you feel all like, and then two hours later you go boom and you're dead, almost. And the reason for that is because the sugar goes up so fast that the insulin has to catch up and go fast into the bloodstream to get all the glucose taken out of the bloodstream, but it's so much it overshoots, and then we have not enough, and we get that sugar blues. After the sugar rush, you get a sugar blues. Where is my Coke? I need another Coke. That's when that happens in my brain. I don't know. And so that's where it's, where it's helpful to get a little understanding, and basically, you put, you know, vegetables have uh, lower, and bread stuff has a higher. I mean, generally, that's the case. Um, but it's just how they measure it. You know, yogurts and stuff is not bad, except all the sugar they put in it. <laughs> so it's, again, one of those things. So that's the glycemic index. So let's go back to the quizzy. Uh -huh. Neutral fats, the ones we eat most, are known as triglycerides. Chemically, they look like the letter E. Three chains of carbons, fatty acid chains, arise from what we call the glycerol backbone. So the glycerol backbone is, the, is this thing, and then the fatty acid chains come out. So the glycerol backbone is, has some more oxygen in it. It gets that back that sets up the uh, ability for all these carbon chains, carbon chains, carbon chains to come out. And when you see these dots here, that means they're long and long and long. They can be as long as they want to be. So they're large molecules. So that's what that's supposed to mean, fatty acid chains. Uh, the carbon in, carbons in the chain are covalently bonded. When all the connections are single bonds, which means the molecule can freely rotate around itself, the carbon chain can arrange parallel and pack tightly. That structure will be a solid at room temperature. So it's more condensed. That's why it's solid at room temperature. It's, it's a physical thing. A good example is butter. How do oils liquid at room temperature differ? Don't 
The kinks, the kinks, yes. It's the kinks. And why do we have kinks? <coughs> do we know? Ha -ha. We can learn. So, when you look at covalent bonds, you have, let's go back to covalent bonds. Where are they? Come on, come on, come on. Ooh, that's dizzy making. There we go. We have an electron and an electron, and they share. And so we can have one or more than one electron share, and that creates one bond, a, a single bond, or a double bond, or a triple bond. And if we have single bonds, the single bonds can rotate around themselves. These are single bonds, so these are supposed to be all carbons. They just make these wiggly lines like that. And the single bonds, the molecules can rotate, so they always rotate so it's used the least amount of space. As soon as it has a double bond, it's stuck in one position. It cannot change. It cannot rotate. And then it cannot make itself use up the least amount of space. And it will have some space, some extra space it uses up. And that makes it then more voluminous, and that makes it liquid at room temperature. Does that make sense? What's interesting is so when they're double bonds, they cannot rotate anymore. They get stuck. And um, when we look at the, the concept question, I have it here. What oils and, uh, so what oils slash fats should we eat and which avoid? Generally, the more processed the food, the less we should eat it. When we, when we dive into, uh, uh, into the body and analyze lipids more, we touch on the term prostaglandins. PGs, prostaglandins, are converted lipids in our body and act, they act like hormones. They chemically influence body function, such as inflammation and blood pressure, for example. In our modern life, body inflammation is one of the most important things to understand when discussing aging and suffering as well as longevity. And they're actually thinking that the body temperature slowly decreases over the decades because we have less chronic pathology or less acute pathologies in our system. Like, and, and our body has to fight less. We have more, the temperature in the house is nice and you know, we don't have to, you know, the body has to work less hard. So that's part of that too. Um, we know three prostaglandin types. To keep healthy, they need to be balanced. Most of our foods spike the inflammatory prostaglandins. That's the red meat and the margarine and all that shit. Oops. <laughs> Both. I like my meat, but you know, we gotta be limiting it a little bit. Most dangerously are trans fats, which are engineered by humans. Margarine is likely the most famous example. Why are those foods so dangerous? Oh, that's difficult. Anybody come up with that? They are artificial. That means they're man-made. So they goes right into this kink. So when we have this kink in an oil, that's natural. It's a cis configuration. If we change it nat no, unnaturally by humans, we change it in a mirror image configuration, which they call the trans configuration, and that the body does not know what to do with that piece of thing. It's like, it's like you're reading plastic. And the, and, and the problem in the body is, it doesn't just create inflammatory, these little prostaglandin hormone things, it stops the good ones from being created. And that's why it's so effed up. And so that, yep. And why did they do that for the wise? Just like to preserve it so it's very like. Well, yeah, and then you got, you know, in the 60s, it's like, oh, butter is bad for you, give you heart attacks. And then they create a margarine. Yeah. So it was this great invention. So, you know, they have to feel cool about themselves. Or, you know, but they have studies where they actually realized that, the, especially above 60, the group that ate the margarine, and they even have it legit in, a, in a state, in legislation. The margarine has one color, one shape, and the butter a different shape back then. And, and it was crazy, but they realized over 60, the margarine group died younger. They had more heart attacks, and, and not, the car, not the butter side group. And they realized that what happens is the inflammation is going on. The clogging of the arteries might not go up as much, but the inflammation is going up in the body, and that creates much more dangerous events and, and more radical um, things like heart attacks. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. So, so that's why we don't want to eat this stuff. So you want to love your avocado. Mm. And they had 10 for 10 in Safeway for the Super Bowl. 
know. I got eight of them. Um, you like your cheese. You better don't tell me not to eat cheese. Um, and your meat, but you do not eat the transit, or at least as little as you can get away with it. Um, so that one we want to lose as much as we can lose, because the, also the body doesn't know what to do with it. It can't get rid of it. It stays stuck in that thing. And um, so do not do the chocolate chip pancake sausage on a stick, please. I know, when I saw that, I almost flew backwards. I didn't know that food exists. And then I went, I went to Santa Cruz and there you can get a Twinkie, deep fried Twinkie thing. I was like, holy cow. All right, so you got, you got that a little bit, that prostaglandin idea? That's all I want you to know. I just want to put that in because it's some goofy stuff. All right. Then let's go to this. A completely different lipid is the phospholipid. Lipids are hydrophobic, which means they separate out in water. We talked about that. If you don't get that concept, talk to me. Wednesday's cool too. Think about it a little more. We can use that quality if we can have molecular Wait, if you can have a molecule that is both oily and watery, an oil film can create a great boundary because water can't penetrate it, or not easily. Phospholipids have a hydrophilic end, the phosphate, and a hydrophobic end, the fatty acid chains. So when you look at a phospholipid, it's not that three fatty acid chains come out of all these carbon backbone, this is the backbone. On this phospholipid, two are the fatty acid chains, and on the other side, one is a phosphate group that attaches. And the phosphate group is hydrophilic, they call it the hydrophilic head, and the, tef, the, the fatty acid chains are the hydrophobic ends, those are the tails. So let's see what the question is. If we stack them tightly next to one another, in a double row with hydrophobic tails pointing at each other, we created that oil film boundary. Is this is the cell membrane basically a false fluid bilayer? I'm not so sure I asked that question true or false, but that's true. It's probably in the video. Does that make sense? Why that would be cool? No, I can. Thank you. Good questions. So when we look at this situation, we have two rows of this molecule. So the, the way it's, it's um, depicted is the fatty acid chains, or the tails, those are hydrophobic, they're oily. And the round thing, that's the phosphate, that's the hydrophilic head, that's the head. So here are the heads, they're pointing to the outside. And the tails go inward. And on the other side, you've got tails coming up, and the head is on the outside again. And so that's a phospholipid a bilayer, two, a layer of one on each side. And so when you take that and you put it in a cell, you can put it around the water, make a sphere out of it. And that's like an oil film, like a buoy, buoys in the ocean that keep all that stuff on the inside on its own and it's water stuff. And on the outside, you also have its own water stuff. So you create a great boundary. And the water cannot go through it because it's like, these are hydrophobic. This inside is hydrophobic, so that's like it's oil. But because we have the phosphates on top, which are okay in water, we can sort of play with that oil film. And it doesn't just, because if you just put oil in water, it just wants to clump together. That wouldn't help. But this way we have it controlled. Basically, you can look at it that way. You control a little bit of an oil film inside, you know, inside um, these two phosphate things, so you can use that as a building block to make boundaries to have, oh, we got a, you know, a, a wall here, and then we have two environments on the outside, or on the other sides. So you can have, have it be around and make a whole cell on the inside. Everything on the inside is unique. It doesn't have to share with the outside. So then that becomes, we call that intracellular and extracellular. We'll talk about that later. But that's how we can use that quality of oil uh, in the body and, and, and wa in, a, in the water environment. It's fascinating how nature just uses these things and puts them together and makes, makes it work. Does that, must that clear it a little bit better? Yeah? Or who, who asked? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I heard it's coming from here. Does that clear it up a little better? All right, good. 
Good, good, good. Question nine. And lastly, in the lipid department, we have to talk about cholesterol. This bad rat molecule is actually a most important building block for many functional molecules. List all that applies. Good, there you go. How do you pronounce it? Cortisol? Yeah, so I just want to make sure we're not just thinking cholesterol is just simply bad because we've been told about that. Like eggs are not bad. I took a cardiovascular seminar and they tell you to eat a dozen eggs a week. You gotta eat good eggs, but they're really good food. So we gotta rethink sort of that because the, um, the cholesterol um, is only bad for us if it's the LDL cholesterol, not the HDL. Oh wait, I think I'm ahead of my game. Here, let's see. Oh, look at that. Lipoproteins carry fat molecules around in the body, in the bloodstream. HDL, high density lipoprotein, carries fats from the body to the liver for processing. LDL distributes the fats from the liver to the rest of the body. Which of these two is known as the good cholesterol? Uh oh, we better speed up. The HDL. And so the reason why is. Any thoughts? Why that would be good? So yeah, you, you, you bring, yeah, the HDL brings the, 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 the fatty stuff from the body to the liver for processing, and the LDL distributes it to the rest of the body. So that's described here. LDL carries fat molecules from the liver to the body, so that's why it's bad. And the HDL is a vacuum cleaner. It picks it up and brings it to the liver to process. That's why we call it good. And for us, the ratio is important. And they told us that eggs are bad before they figured out these two different things, before they differentiated. So we have to just be, you know, food for thought. Be careful with it. Proteins are our work molecules. They are good for construction, such as in a tendon or ligament, as well as provide many functions to the body, such as carrying oxygen in the red blood cells, or attacking a virus and help the immune system fight it. Fundamentally, they are made up of a chain of amino acids, which are their basic building blocks. We have 20 of them, eight of them are essential. What does that mean? You have to eat them. The body cannot make them. So if you don't have those eight, like if you're vegan, you gotta make sure you know what food groups you eat because not all the foods have all the eight essentials in them. And so you make sure you don't shortchange yourself. Meat's got all in it. That's one of the pluses about meat. It's got all the essentials in it. I mean, we just don't eat that much meat, but you know. All right. Let's finish up with this. Now, these are very good inputs. And we'll have a whole chapter on nutrition where I just go through the baseline stuff. So we have some ideas. It's not a nutrition. Nutrition class is a really hard class. It's a really great class. It's, I mean, you know, food is medicine. And medicine is food. You know, aspirin. You know, and then everything is grandma remedies or something. Because aspirin was willow bark. You know, people will get the bark from the willow tree and put it on their knee and it helps. It felt better. And then at some point in the 1880s, somebody figured out, let's extract it. And then that was salicylic acid. And so that became aspirin. But it's, you know, not that we want to eat willow bark, but it's in nature. And a lot of times what we try to do is chemi chemistry, we try to extract what works in nature to make it more potent because we just take the piece that works. And sometimes that's great, and sometimes it's hard for other parts in the body. And so that's you know, how medicine got sort of created over the years, over time. Uh, but anyway, the se back to amino acids. The sequence of amino acids determines the type of protein. There are three dimensional structures that twist and fold. Fibrous proteins are more string-like that help bind structures together. A good example is a tendon or a ligament. Globular proteins, on the other hand, are more complex in the f and as they are functional. A good example is a hemoglobin carrying oxygen to the red blood cell. Which type is quite easily destroyed? Globular. The globular. If you go, you, 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 you find a dehydrated something on the beach, I have a seal skeleton, the fibers in the disc, between the bones, you can still see those. They're still there. So.
So a ligament in, or like the ligament, the Achilles tendon down here, that's a ligament, right? You understand ligaments? Ligaments attach bo muscles in the bones. And then the tendon is like your MCL or your ACL in the knee that holds the bones together. They don't contract, they just are rubber bands going from bone to bone. So those are fibrous proteins and those are not easily destroyed. The globular protein, I think you see that easy is when you put an egg in a, in a you know, make a sunny side up egg, first the clear becomes white. That's the destroying destruction of that protein. That's how fast heat can change it. All right, enzymes are some of the coolest proteins. They help the body chemi body's chemical reactions by making or breaking bonds between molecules. They're unique uh, for each reaction and give great control to what goes on in the body. Enzymes are named by their functions, such as lipase, which breaks down lipids. Lipase, lipids, right? Um, in the what is the suffix that we use to name enzymes? ASC. If you see ASC, you think enzyme. If it's not, it's like one in a million. Look at all these things. Woo, we jumped through all that stuff. We don't need to know that. that is the enzyme. The thing I want you to know about the enzyme is yes, they're very specific. So this enzyme only splits maltose into two glucoses. Only. That's it. Nobody else. That's why if you have you can't eat milk stuff because you got, what is that in the story? Um, the lactose intolerance, because you don't have lactase. So we have to eat the lactase. But other sugars you just got the stuff for, just not the lactase. And that's why that is giving us such trouble, with just more pressure. And so, so that's one thing, the specificity. Then the active side, it's a shape dependent how some it's really shape I mean it's it's crazy but it is really the shape how it is how it fits in the lock and the key is what it's going to be able to do and the molecules find each other because of the shape and, in, and so that's the active side and then the other thing is the enzyme is not changed when you use it so when you use a maltose you get to the enzyme you break it apart get two glucoses out of it the enzyme can be reused again that's also helpful and good. And then this graph just shows us how we depict in terms of what this does, this breaking of this bond is what they consider here. The activation energy is lowered. We don't have to put that much energy into breaking this bond if it were just floating around. But with the help of the enzyme, we lower that bond breakage energy and that speeds up an elect a, a, a chemical reaction. So that's the rate of chemical reaction gets greatly enhanced by doing that. So that's basically what that means. Enzyme, you can tell I like enzymes, huh? And then we have one more here. And you probably heard of DNA. You probably heard of DNA the part of the cell that holds the information of how to make different uh, types of proteins uh, body uses. In its fundamental makeup, it is a strand of four different nucleotides. They are arranged in very specific sequence which codes for the sequence of an amino acid that makes up the protein. Name the four nucleotides that we have in the body, or that makes up DNA. Anybody? Right there, right? So what I'm talking about is, that's the DNA, the double helix molecule. And you've got the backbone here, the red and the blue, and then towards the center, you've got these different nucleotides. They're called nucleotides, they come in. And you have four types of DNA. You have adenine, thiamine, and guanine, and cytosine. And they, they are complementary. So always, when you see a yellow, you're gonna have a green. If it's a red, you've got a blue. You always have an adenine and the thymine go together, and a guanine and the cytosine. You don't have a cytosine mixed with a thymine or a cytosine with an adenine. That's just how they fit. And that's what they call them, their uh, base, complementary base pairs. That's what they call them. So that's what I'm looking for there. Um, when we then go further on Wednesday in the, in the class and make protein out of that, basically, we have to unzip this, take it apart, 
and then take this one, this strap with all these rungs to stick it out. And three of those in, diff in a sequence calls for one amino acid. And then the amino acid makes protein. So that's how that goes together. So if it's, if it's an adenine, a guanine, and then a thymine, that means a specific amino acid. If it's an adenine, an adenine, a thymine, it's a specific amino acid. So there are all these different possibilities that this, what they call triplet, these three things can give. And we'll talk about that. So that's basically right there, you've got protein synthesis coupled. All right? So that's how that goes together. And then last but not least, on here we talk about ATP, the energy storage molecule. For us, of importance is the, 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 three, tr the three phosphates, the triphosphates that are attached to the adenosine molecule. Breaking the bond that attaches the third phosphate to the molecule liberates a great amount of energy that the body can use for work. Muscle contraction, for example. Once the bond is broken and the energy is released, the molecule has two phosphates left. What do we call that? ADP. Good. Adenosine diphosphate. So the triphosphate and the diphosphate. And we even can have an AMP, a monophosphate, which then in the body is used a lot for different things because it's such a ubiquitous molecule, it's so vastly available that we can use AMP for, uh, we do that a lot for com um, uh, communication between, because when, when it depends on what the hormone you have, you can't penetrate the cell wall because it's fat. You have to talk to the cell, to the inside of the cell differently. And AMPs are used for that a lot of the time. All right, so that's it. <laughs>